audience, uh, respected Minister of Agriculture, Cooperation and Marketing for Pressing, Government of AB, Mr. Kakan Government Medical, Mr. Chirin Chaudhary, AFS, Principal Secretary to the Government for Agriculture, Cooperation and Marketing and Pressing, eminent speakers from various diversified industries, audience who have been come from various industries. We from Andhra Pradesh welcome you all for this August session. Uh, today's event will be with the keynote address by the Honorable Minister and also a uh, vivid topic based on the future of food processing sector and opportunities of foreign direct investment in India would be a major topic because we being an agrarian state and uh, a food processing power of South India and India we would be emphasizing more of the foreign direct investments and opportunities in the coming years for food processing. So, I would welcome warmly Honorable Minister Kagani Gordhan Redigaru to please come to the dais and give us a keynote address. Thank you. Thank you. Principal Secretary, Cooperation, Marketing and Food Processing Government of Andhra Pradesh, Mr. Kiran Kumar, Head of Spices Business, Agri Business Division, ITC Limited, Mr. Chandra Mowli, Business Head, and Amit Mani, Commercial Director, Sachya Rao, and Mr. Prakash Babu, and CEO Food Processing, Mr. Sridhar Reddy, another Yes, attending to this session. Good evening and warm welcome to the World Food India 2023 event. This is truly an honor to stand before such a distribution gathering of stakeholders in the food processing industry. Today we come together to celebrate the tremendous potential and success of this sunrise sector in India and to discuss how we can further nurture and harness its capabilities for the benefit of our nation. India's agricultural sector has been the backbone of our economy for centuries. As an agrarian economy, we have been blessed with fertile lands, a diverse range of crops, and a workforce deeply connected to the soil. This synergy with nature has given us a significant advantage in the food processing sector. First and foremost, the food processing industry holds the promise of immense employment opportunities. It is without a doubt the sector with the highest potential for employment generation compared to other manufacturing sectors. We are not just creating jobs, we are fostering economic empowerment for our people. Moreover, the growth of the food processing sector has a direct and positive impact on the farmers provides crucial support to them by ensuring that they receive remunerative prices for their produce. Our farmers are backbone of our agricultural industry and their well-being is at the heart of our policies and initiatives. Andhra Pradesh stands as a testament to what can be achieved with the right of mix of natural advantages, infrastructure and skilled labor. It is remarkable that this state holds the number of one position in terms of registered food processing industries with a substantial 13.83% share. The numbers speak for themselves with around 1,85,000 people employed directly in this sector. Additionally, the unorganized sector further contributes by employing around 4 to 5 lakhs individuals. Some of the advantages of Andhra Pradesh, AP ranks number one in production of papaya, lime, Tomato, coconut, poultry, cocoa, chilies, banana, sweet lime, oil palm, and shrimp. Ranks number two in production of paddy, maize, mango, sweet orange, cashew, and turmeric. Ranks number four in production of groundnut, milk, and meat in the country. Andhra Pradesh under the leadership of our Honorable Chief Minister Sri Vaya Jagan Mohan Reddy has focused 
on Portland industrialization and points to become gateway to the east. Six operational ports with 250 MMT cargo handling capacity and four more under construction, nine fishing harbors under construction with staff of the art facilities. Operational airports, three international, three domestic, 7,040 kilometers of rail network and 46,000 kilometers of road network, 12 operational food parks spread across the state. Six NABL accredited food testing laboratories. Entrepreneurs have sufficient skilled manpower to cater the industry needs. AP has nine universities with dedicated courses related to food processing in the state. Six government universities and three private universities, 78 industrial training institutes. With our advantages, AP is a high potential state for investment in food processing sector. As we navigate this journey, let us remember that our actions have a profound impact on the lives of our farmers, our people and the Indian economy as a whole. I look forward to provide and to productive discussions and fruitful collaborations during this event. Together we can continue to nurture this sunrise sector and usher in a bright future for India. So I conclude conveying my sincere thanks to you all and let the discussion speak. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable thoughts. Now I invite our principal secretary, Mr. Chiranjee Chaudhary Daru, principal, uh, to act as a moderator and guide us through this panel discussion. Thank you. Please welcome, sir. As Kalkani Governor Edigaru also is one of the eminent agricultural favorite minister. So we would also request you also to share your thoughts as a panelist. Thank you. I would welcome Mr. Kiran Kumar, Head of Spices Business at Agribusiness Division, ITC Limited, to please. I welcome Mr. Chandramoli Kurubi, Business Head, Israel Ingredients, South Asia and Business Analysts. Please join us. We welcome Mr. Amit Mani, Commercial Director, Southwest Asia, Kerry Ingredients. Please join us. I welcome Mr. Satya Rao Garu, Head Licensing, Mondays India. Push preventive, please offer We welcome Mr. Prakash Babugaru, Associate Vice President, EDB, to please kindly see the guys. As today we have eminent speakers, industrialists, and Minister himself, I ask moderator. Principal Secretary Chirangi Chaudhary Garu, please open the session and give the thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as uh, eminent speakers are there and they have been working in this 
Just uh, before uh, me, in the key note address, the Honorable Minister talked about uh, India being privately a ruler economy, currently the contribution to the GDP from the infrastructure and the sector keeps varying between 14 to 17 percent, now to almost about 16 percent. But look at the large number of people who are dependent on it, not only as producers but also as direct labor. So, it's a clear cut indication that we need to move towards that addition. It means we need to move from freshly produced disposal of agri and allied produce into value added, that which is quite highly and low. Now, when we talk about foreign direct investment, just yesterday in the inaugural speech, the Honorable Prime Minister said that in the last nine years, about uh, 50 lakh US dollars. The overall ecosystem at the country level, if you look at it, see India is currently a food surplus country, be it uh, agriculture produce, horticulture produce, marine, aquaculture, dairy, no, poultry, meat. If you look at it, you know, we have almost 80 percent of the country population of the world. We have a long coastline. And for this, alone has a coastline of 970 kilometers. So we have a huge exposure in the core <coughs> products as well. But as I said, most of them is getting exported in fresh, raw form, not much of value addition. Even in value addition, which is taking place, that is the moment. Now, when value addition takes place, it generates a common impact. I was always of the opinion that it is the tourism sector which has the highest potentiality for the economic generation. But I was going through the literature and it says it is not the tourism but the food processing industry which every unit of currency is spent, it generates more number of employment. So we being a surplus you know, production country, we have a huge skilled manpower. India has the natural demographic different the education and the skill development is being pushed by the government of India, by various state governments, even the industrialists. So we have the surplus raw material, we have the skilled manpower. In terms of infrastructure, that we talk about road connectivity, rail connectivity, sea connectivity, you know, or air connectivity. India in civilization you knows that it is one of the fastest growth. There is a lot of things in the world. And after every airline, you know, there is like a lot of civilization. So infrastructure is there. Then the policy. The policy of the government of India, how far it is helpful for the investors to come. So, our policy is also positive. Now, what we are looking at is maybe you could tell us if there are any policy bottlenecks which further require some kind of you know, improvement or some kind of easiness to be done. Otherwise, the government of India and many of the state governments, when we talk about Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh has been continuously ranked number one in the ease of doing business. It, is, it takes 21 days to get all the clearances from the various departments. And it is done by the independent agency, not by state government of all countries. Similarly, the government of India has been consistently improving. So the overall ecosystem of the climate or the parameters which uh, uh, enables investment, these are all positive. And in the future time to come, the market is there in India. 
It's not that on the outside, it is the domestic market which is quite void, which is increasing. The per capita income is growing at a very fast rate. The disposable income available with the people of the state is increasing. We have the large middle class population. Rural area has a huge, you know, robust demand. So if you look at all these things, there are all positive indicators, indicators, indications for anybody, any multinationals or any foreign investor to come to this country, invest here, because you get a lot of other advantages which you may not get in other places. So with that intention, today we would like to hear from all of you that what are your specific ideas, plans, suggestions which can be compiled and with this we can also give a broad suggestions to the government of India. We could use it for our own policy development within the state government so that it will ultimately help us within a definite timeline to grow toward the direction what we all of us decide and what is the primary objective of today's you know, discussion. So I don't get into the discussion uh, more this deliberation and I would like to hear more from you just to sum up to when we talk about food processing or the wastage, the current wastage, if you look at, I was going through one of the statistics which has been done by NAPPONS, that is NABAR consultancy, it says that almost about 155,000 1, crores is the value, economic value. Now forget about the economic value, if we convert, if we reduce this wastage yeah, into some kind of value-added products, yeah, by developing various infrastructure through the investment. So maybe one of the constraints could be that the adequate investment is not going into the sector and therefore we are not able to grow. Now all of us we are experiencing you know, the heat of global warming climate change. All of us we are talking about the international conference before the next COP uh, is also happening in COP27. is happening by the international global leaders of the great When we reduce this best as it is going to convert into reducing our carbon footprint and which is indirectly again and directly going to help us in reducing uh, this impact of climate change and global warming. So that is another thing which is going to have a long term impact uh, uh, with the kind of initiatives which currently the government is trying to take. So with this I end here and uh, maybe we start with uh, so which side should I start from right or the left? So we'll start with maybe the Amit and then this is to the right and left and then this combination would be a good combination. I request Amit and you'd like to have your specific concrete ideas, you know, which can be converted or translated into some kind of action and that you know the results can be seen and maybe as I said, some of the policies also in the country point. Uh, which requires any kind of correction or further improvement. Mm -hmm. That's also correct. Professor, the first question is to So, um, so, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, when we talk about food processing industry, and there are two things that we look at. One is agriculture, which is the, the basis of food processing industry. And agriculture with the agriculture, cereal grains, aquaculture, or other animals, and the second thing is the processing part. So, on an average, if you look at from an India perspective, maybe 2018 to 2020, uh, the FDI in food processing or allied sector is around 4.2 billion dollars, which is a massive number. From an industry perspective, as several mentioned, 16% of the employees, 16% of industries operating in India are actually food processing or allied. When you talk about food processing industries, we divide it into various subsectors. You can say dairy, we are the number one producer of dairy. 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 That's where a lot of challenges are because when you talk about wastages, the wastages could happen before reaching the factory or it could happen before. So you are talking about pre-harvest as well as you are talking about harvest and post-harvest. Then there is vegan poultry, so Andhra is practically the number one state in, in egg production uh, in India and then there is a huge talk about vegan poultry. So out of the 38 billion worth of goods that India export from food, most of them are in raw formats. When you talk about raw formats, 
राइस बीन नंबर वन जो है बासमती राइस वुड बी से अराउंड थ्री पॉइंट एट बिलियन वर्थ ऑफ एक्सपोर्ट थ्री बिलियन ऑफ अनदर एक्सपोर्ट देन कम्स मरीन आइटम्स विच इज सिक्स पॉइंट सम ऑन बिलियंस ऑफ फिश एंड ऑयल वेन वी टॉक अबाउट एफ डी आई इट इज नॉट अबाउट ओनली इन्वेस्टमेंट इट इज ऑल्सो अबाउट अंडरस्टैंडिंग हाउ यू कैन इम्प्रूव द सेक्टर ऑफ इंडिया सो एफ डी आई डजन मीन दैट यू ओनली हैव टू गेट अ प्रोसेसिंग इट ऑल्सो मीन्स टू गेट द टेक्नोलॉजी एंड टू इंक्रीज द शेल्फ लाइफ ऑफ द प्रोडक्ट और द वैल्यू एडिशन ऑफ द प्रोडक्ट सो दैट यू कैन बी कंज्यूम द प्रोडक्ट ओवर अ लार्जर पीरियड ऑफ टाइम फ्रॉम अ सस्टेनेबिलिटी परस्पेक्टिव वी अंडरस्टैंड वॉट इज एक्सेप्टेबल इन दिस markets outside of india so that you can produce in india and export outside of india i'll give you an example so frozen food as an industry when you talk about potato so nobody thought it they would export potato right now when you talk about frozen food in the south east asia and middle east market has been catered out of india out of four plants so you talk about 80000 tons plus of food rice which goes out of india while india consumption is 20000 tons we are supplying 80000 tons outside of india so the impact of fdi is not only about investment it is also about know how and how the product will be expected accepted in the markets outside of india uh, from a labor perspective or job creation perspective the statistics says says there are 90 lakhs 9 million direct jobs created by food processing industry allied industries are not touching about uh, then you are talk about value added products so When you talk about processing, so processed food as a category in the industry, you also talk about specialty ingredients, and that's where we need to focus on because the R&D today is on top level on basic foods. How do you improve, say, the shelf life of a product? How do you improve the taste of a product? These are all showing how the specialty ingredients need to be done. So the R&D or the focus of basic foods should be also to understand how to create those value-added specialty products. Uh, to gain the confidence of the market outside of India, uh, I would prefer to stop there because there are many more factors who would like to talk about it. But if there are any questions later, I would be happy to answer. Thank you, sir. Very nice. So let's do a few questions. We will take at the end, and uh, now we will give time to our uh, uh, panel speakers to complete uh, sharing their ideas, and then we can. Uh, Maybe the next time, because the second part uh, we just talk about this. Eh? See, that is like India when we look at uh, because large number of our farmers, seventy five percent land use is more margin of fragmented land. So therefore, that kind of scale of production or uh, is not possible. We are also looking at a cost-effective technology which is suitable, customized, which is suitable to Indian conditions. Not something which is suitable in Western country, European country, as it is being brought here. So that is also one question here. So is it right to answer that it is customized, you know, the technology, R&D, of course, is a continuous activity, and you know that needs to be done. Shelf life, you know, the taste and acceptability, nutrition value, and overall, a kind of, uh, you know, what as a common citizen we read about. You know, That processed food is unhealthy. No, that is what we need. And they say that okay, these are junk food, processed food. So that is another area where you know all of us we need to look into it and see that how healthy we can get and how do we communicate this to the consumers eh? so that that kind of notion which is generated there about many of the processed foods and processed foods eh? that also gets eliminated. So thank you. And we really look forward to your suggestions. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, please. Well, thank you so much, sir. As the topic says, uh, we have there are two subtopics. That one is the future of uh, food processing in India and opportunities for the DI. When we talk about India, like I mean, I'm talking about say, say eight, ten years back. Usually, everybody looks at outside India that you have 130 crore mouths and they they try to multiply. Let's see. This is the potential, but that potential doesn't exist in India. As you are saying, sir, that only one percent or two percent of agricultural produce is converted. So, what what is that? You know, uh, creating that kind of a gap that we have so much of agricultural produce availability of raw materials that are there, but why we are failing to convert that? Is it the demand that is lacking, 
or is it like people are preferring only the stable food products, whether that is causing the uh, you know, preference to have fresh produce over the processed food. Now, uh, I feel personally that we have reached such an inflection point where food processing sector is the space to be in and next 20 years sector is one of the going to the sunshine sector uh, for next 20, 25 years at least. Okay, purely because being and associated with food ingredient industry, we see uh, the processed food world very closely, whether it is dairy or aquaculture or bakery or whichever segment you talk about. We see the industry and uh, you are seeing a lot of uh, conversion of value-added products that are getting into the space. We, we are very familiar. Uh, till uh, a couple of months back, we have seen how the tomato prices have gone up and a few farmers have become overnight rich and then within within a month again uh, the situation has turned whether you know, a farm level processing converting the puree like in western world uh, you know, how many people use the fresh produce or you know, how much of purees or primary processed products agriculture products are used which can help in containing the prices at the same time your food products can be you know, value added food products can be used so it helps in creating the income for both the farmer, the social and uh, cultural changes also will help there. At the same time, uh, the income generation will be more. So these kind of aspects will help. And second thing is, uh, similar case what we keep seeing uh, closely is during COVID and uh, whenever there is a inflation or uh, whatever uh, geopolitical situations that you see uh, in Europe and the other part of the world, whenever such scenarios happen, you always see that some of your exports are imp impacted and how in that scenario that you negate and whether you are rather than exporting the simple uh, basic agricultural produce whether value added products could help you there in order to differentiate and uh, gain more revenues. I think these are the points which I uh, broadly, broadly touch upon and probably once, once this is addressed FDI investments I feel uh, obviously uh, would automatically routine. Uh, we have an internal discussion within our company based in Frankfurt. So people are now looking at India like, oh, you want to invest? Why are you investing already in a markets which are stagnant or growing uh, at minimal levels? Why don't you look at growth areas where you have opportunity to grow along with that, you know, the, what the market is picking up? And uh, it is a win-win situation for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Sanmori. See, we talked about what tomato. Uh, all Indians, we are familiar with this tomato and onion, the annual cycle of highs and lows. Uh, suddenly, the prices shoot up in a particular time of the year, and we have not been able to crack this problem so far. We have tried various kinds of interventions, uh, but uh, so far we have not been successfully able to uh, crack this problem. That how? What do we do? ensure that. But something needs to be done. We know, we, know, we know the problem, we know what could be the solution, but somehow we have not been able to implement it effectively. In Andhra Pradesh, in fact, uh, through the Food Processing Society, uh, we are trying this solar dehydrated, you know, this tomato, and you know, some other fruits and vegetables. Today we were also looking at uh, the technology which is available for is drying. Our Honorable Minister and we were discussing that what is the acceptability of these dehydrated produce domestically, let's say among the Indian population. So currently maybe it can go into the hotels or restaurants or that kind of thing, but the people always prefer to have a fresh instead of that. So maybe these are the areas which we need to work on and it is a continuous work. It's not any, it's a continuous work. And there, this you know, the global partnership, the people. See, when we look at foreign direct investment, as I said, see, it is not only in terms of the money which we are looking at the currency. Our own experience of you no know, working with the private sector in Andhra Pradesh in the horticulture, we saw when the private <coughs> industries come, they also come with plethora of you know the knowledge and other insights. So the knowledge with the people, with the government, with the private sector. All these stakeholders together, cumulatively, help us to come out with a model which becomes more sustainable and more perfect. So that is the kind of no, thing we are looking at. So thank you. Thank you, Chandmohan And uh, maybe 
Prakash Nagar, he is our uh, Vice President of uh, Economic Development Board in Andhra Pradesh. I would request him to share his views. So I am, uh, on behalf of uh, Andhra Pradesh Economic Development Board, I would like to kind of uh, uh, probably talk beyond the food processing. Okay, food processing for the experts. So I'll be talking about the infrastructure uh, which is available for these FDIs to come into the state of Andhra Pradesh. So as already Andhra Pradesh Minister Sir and Andhra uh, Pradesh Sir mentioned, we have the longest post uh, six operation ports, four upcoming ports, 10 fishing harbors in the cost of development. And on top of that, uh, AP is one of the states uh, which has got the biggest uh, acquired land bank, about 46,000 acres of land bank, which is already acquired and ready for distribution. Yeah, so, when you come back to the other states in the country, the land uh, offered uh, for industrial investments in AP is very complicated. In some of the industrial parks, uh, I can assure you, uh, the rates, the cost per acre is so complicated and unbeatable, I guess. So on the land part, that's what uh, we offer. And uh, we provide uh, basic infrastructure, electricity and water to the doorstep of wherever we will be uh, to the So uh, land mine, uh, basic infrastructure, the road, that's what we provide. And also we have the three industrial corridors running in the state. Across the country, uh, about uh, 10, 11 industrial corridors are running, out of which three are running through the state of Andhra Pradesh. So along these industrial corridors, three, we have in Chennai, Chennai, Bangalore, Bangalore, Hyderabad. Those are the three industrial corridors we have got. Along these corridors, we are developing specific clusters, the textile cluster, or food processing clusters, you know, uh, leather industry, electronics manufacturing clusters, when we speak of electronics management clusters, one of the 10 odd in the country, four odd in the state of Bangladesh. So uh, there, there is a lot of scope. And especially, again, uh, just going back onto the food processing aspect, as we all know, uh, AP is one of the biggest exporters of uh, seafood, and for shrimp especially. So a lot of opportunity for the say, food processing industry across all these 10 fishing harbors that are going to come up. And, uh, uh, the entire ecosystem, there is scope for the entire uh, marine ecosystem that will be developed around these uh, fishing harbors. So, in brief, uh, I would say uh, those are the things. Yeah, if you need further information, I'm available. And in the course of this discussion, you can have further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> for highlighting the strength which Alpudas has. But uh, one of the most important strength which Andhra has is the people of Andhra The most vibrant community I have seen anywhere. And those of you who would have uh, met more people from Andhra Pradesh, anywhere in the globe, anywhere, anywhere, you would have seen how many people there. So that is our biggest strength. So they will provide all kinds of support, whatever you require. So thank you so much for having me for this. Maybe uh, Kiran, uh, who represents ITC. And the ITC has a wide presence in Andhra Pradesh. In fact, they were born in Andhra Pradesh uh, during the pre-independence days. Uh, so I request uh, Mr. Kiran to share his thoughts and maybe his thoughts. Just a few thoughts overall on the food processing sector, right? So definitely I come from the Bangalore of the spices and I've been through and Andhra Pradesh in the capital of Chile. Almost half of the India's chilies come from that particular So definitely I'll touch up on more on that subject. Why broadly I'll be touching on the overall food processing sector. So if I look at the subject in two segments, one is domestic, one is export. I try to break it in two segments. In domestic, definitely food processing is a segment which is moving forward. So if you look at the generation before, if they would be buying the raw materials and probably processing it either at home or in small mills and cross to be used for their own consumption. And if you look at the current generation, they are actually purchasing the finished goods on the shelf. 
So to the next step, there's a lot of policy which have been brought by the government in the form of PLA schemes, supporting the retail tax uh, which is being brought in the market. So that is something which is already having a push in terms of the demand. At the same time, there's a lot of push from the industry to establish some of these possible capital source. So that is going on, going, which is wonderful. The question which is coming in terms of the exports. So like uh, Sindhu sir did mention, we are in the surplus state. So with surplus raw material availability, the question is how far are we able to generate and develop, bring this food processing so that India becomes much more stronger. If you look at the agri uh, exports, and sir did mention India has really grown in terms of the agri exports. In around roughly 2010, we were doing, I would say, 10 to 12 billion dollars of Indian export, agri and LA. Last year we touched 50 billion dollars, that is a 5x growth in the entire Indian agri export. And the target, I think, by 2030 is almost 100 billion dollars. So you need to double the 50 billion dollars in the next 10 years. Now the game to do is definitely, like the producer mentioned, is the food processing and the value addition. Now if you look at, for example, of chilies, spices, right? From India, most of the most of the chilies that get exported is still, I would say, predominantly raw material, only 10%. Versus if you look at one of my competing nations, like China, from China the export, 80% is valuable. What is the difference? That is something we have So what is making China's chili export? predominantly value added, versus India export still raw material. Today, whatever we supply to China, still 30% of India's exports go to China. Almost 98% of it is in raw material form. Why can't we supply to them in a finished good form? Any value addition cannot be happened here. So there are a couple of areas we definitely need to look at in terms of the export incentives or opportunities which, for example, Chinese government provide. Just to understand, we take a leaf from the book of China. They provide 10% incentives for people to export in the raw, in the finished good form, instead of raw material form. The raw material form, the incentive is only 1%. In India, the export incentive is same, that it is raw material or finished good. So that is something we need to look at. How do we differentiate, or I would say encourage from the policy perspective, people who are actually making investments and driving value addition within India. And over a period of time, that can actually convert India becoming the, I would say, value added segment. And at the same time, with valuation increasing, certain state of the art technologies, like Amir sir was mentioned, they can actually be brought in. And even Chandra sir was mentioning why the way discussions are happening in the source nation, why can't we build more technology within India itself, not only transfer. So those things can happen. So one thing from policy perspective to look at is how do we encourage more valuation as an export through certain policy intervention. That definitely is one part. The second part is while we are exporting spices from India and we are looking at chili as, for example, I will use this uh, increase the value addition of chilies. There are certain nations that look at, for example, Vietnam or Thailand. They are becoming the hubs for like spices. So, Andhra already has a great, I would say, strength in spices. It is chilies or turmeric as well in Islamabad and uh, in the border states, Dugirala in, in Andhra. You can become the hub because you have a central core of spices with you. You need to have a strong policy for imports or re-export because not all spices as a platter is available within Andhra Pradesh. So there are methods to bring certain herbs from Egypt, some of the different value additions from Vietnam. So today Vietnam is actually adopting that approach and trust me, lot of companies have actually set shop in Vietnam. They are bringing spices all over the world, they are actually packing it and sending it back to the rest of the world. You can become a hub by creating a powerful policy on how do I create an import for export model and bring a lot of this knowledge and technology to Andhra Pradesh and the uh, economy. Like I would say, I think Prakash uh, was mentioning this, clusters wise is fantastic opportunity in Andhra Pradesh. But some of these things today we are heavily restricted on the imports. So some of the areas how we can use focusing on a particular cluster can really break the jinx and can become a big hub. That is second part. The third part on the learning you can look at is Value chain, I would say, improvements. Uh, uh, Sir, did mention about climate change. Definitely is a huge challenge. We are working on how we can look at climate proofing some of the added, I would say, surplus. Because what our surplus was saying has to remain surplus to make things happen, right? But climate change is definitely impacting. The temperature increase or the humidity increase definitely is impacting. So we need to bring some of the technologies. For example, there are a lot of drones, breaks, now we are speaking nowadays. We did try a lot of technology, I think 
uh, such as talking about solar drive technologies, but some of them will be still uh, quite expensive. So we need to look at how do we bring some of this knowledge as a producing or manufacturing within India and bring these technologies to be in terms of let's say cost effective. And that technology transfer through certain policies of FDA which help you to do climate proofing and also ensure the rest of the entire value chain is I would say efficient to ensure the food processing is very good and this becomes central. So these are the three points I would touch upon sir. Thank you so much. Thank you Mr. Kiran. Well, these are the critical points when we talk about the expansion of the food business industry, attracting a foreign direct investment, whether it's the policy environment, the kind of incentives which are maybe Vietnam is a successful model from where a lot of things can be done because we the Vietnam, whether in terms of export product, whether it is spices. I mean, many sectors they have been really growing exponentially and very fast and maybe there are certain. You could share some of those insights, which anyway, we can look into it and see that how uh, we can implement it. So, thank you so much uh, for your insights. And then we have uh, Mr. Satya Ram from Mondays. So, I request Mr. Satya Ram to yeah, the customers. So, I think, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have already touched upon a lot of things on the food processing industry. I'm not going to add again to what he required. So what we are the industry of the chocolate, we witnessed already on this stage is one of the best way for us to set up our large industry. So for us, one of the important uh, immediate uh, raw material is the food. So uh, which is our basic uh, raw material and uh, currently we've been dependent on a lot of imports. So although we have abundance in the cocoa plantation can be carried out in other places in India. And we are doing it with the, with the local farmers. <coughs> we are adopting, that's actually a crop which is uh, between the coconut and uh, this is the multi-crop commercial crop. You can do it with the coconut. So you don't need to allocate a separate land for it. So we are already working with the uh, local farmers. We are trying to bring more cocoa to the our, our, our internal consumption and as well as the rest of the other, I mean, other industries also can make use of it. So right now we have a lot of dependency on the Indonesia and the African countries we bring cocoa from there. So only the 10% of cocoa what is being produced in India we currently we are processing. And rest 90 to 80 to 90% of cocoa is being imported from the outside the country. So there is a potential opportunity uh, in bringing the cocoa processing uh, within the country or within the state so there is abundance of the technology available, so we can make use of the local sourcing and can process in locally and then they can make use of in our chocolate production. We have already made a substantial investment in the state of Andhra Pradesh, so and uh, we are continuing to invest. We have recently signed an another agreement with the government. There is a tremendous support to the government in terms of infrastructure, water management, electricity, and everything. So if we create a good opportunity and uh, some uh, ancillary units to the uh, agricultural sector, so which will ultimately boost the economy of the India and the rural market as well. So, uh, with that, I, uh, I mean, request the government of uh, uh, to take the issue of the OPPO import, which is uh, uh, one of the biggest challenge. Once we can actually uh, uh, wave off the import, I think there is a huge potential opportunity for to go and process those. Thank you, Mr. Kiran. I think uh, now it will not be individual and everybody will be free to enjoy it. But just to sum up and before that maybe uh, we'll go into the audience if you'd like to make any suggestions or you would like to seek any clarifications yeah? and then we will go into the concluding part and the panel speakers also, you can also interview if you feel that some point is uh, yet to be discussed or covered. Any of the audience uh, would be interested in seeking any clarification or giving any suggestions?
respected uh, Honorable Minister and the rest of the band members. I think this is one of the best sessions that I saw. You know, like the subject is well uh, I mean, like distributed and uh, a lot of insights uh, into process. Um, of course, uh, it's not just investment means it's not just the idea. It's an in-house investments also. Then much more uh, uh, investments that Indians, uh, Indian industries itself uh, invest in the construction of new industries. Uh, as pertaining to the investments in other places, a lot of queries there. Uh, normally, on average, the global uh, I mean, investment on infrastructure, on average, in other countries, do accept around 6%, whereas we stand on 1.5% to 2%. What we, I mean, what the GDP that comes to, I mean, like to process. That's what, I mean, uh, at that level here. So we are far, far behind to the, I mean, like, that uh, uh, investment in infrastructure. Of course, government of India is doing uh, a lot of grants. Uh, the processing sector. In that respect, I just want to ask the minister, are we, I mean, uh, is there anything that, uh, uh, in that part, incentive structure, uh, state part, is there anything that government of Pradesh is going to give to the new industries? That's one thing. Second, the point that, uh, as uh, Prakash Babu Gadu was telling, like, uh, this, the uh, land cost, as now existing in Andhra Pradesh, cheaper than other states. But uh, the, the current scenario in Andhra Pradesh is something different from, say, let's say, when compared to Hyderabad, people intend to come to Hyderabad uh, because of various reasons. Uh, Andhra Pradesh is still, uh, we are a very new state, uh, in my opinion, and it requires a lot of uh, support from the government. So the price, uh, which is currently, I mean, like uh, uh, the available prices are much, much higher than compared to other states, which are the instrument may put up this and uh, do something to reduce the prices. Like, whatever the prices that have been fixed and all that are continuing. But that's one of the major things. The second thing is, uh, since the uh, secretary said, mention like anything, I mean, from, uh, you can comment on policies also. Uh, the earlier undeveloped lands uh, were to be registered, I mean, like, uh, what do you call it, outright registration. Uh, uh, now, in the new policy, it's not there. That being, okay. yeah, yeah, I think if this is relaxed. In fact, uh, I was one of the, I signed a uh, whole new development among the last global industry. For that reason, uh, uh, I just stepped back. So this is the other thing. See, uh, we are comparing the Andhra with Telangana. So one thing I must, because I am not commenting any other thing. Because only if you come to the facilities, infrastructure. So Andhra is having all kinds of connectivities. Telangana is not having to go only dry ports. So the one thing. Because since Rabat is established in the world, so everybody is from Hyderabad, especially few industries like IT. Coming to the food processing, uh, why one has to select Andhra Pradesh? We are giving, as you said, we are giving all the incentives. Electricity, we are giving to your cost, we are providing water, we are giving land. And sometimes, depending upon the investment, depending upon the employment generation, we are giving many incentives, even if you are talking about the land cost. So we are giving subsidy in land transport. And uh, now we are giving a saving also. That is conditional saving. Saying that whatever purpose, suppose if somebody takes for a food processing, it should be placed for the food processing. So because banks are carrying for this, this thing, so we change the policy. And we are giving a saving, conditional saving. Saying that whatever purpose we are allowing, so the same purpose we have to utilize the land. So now we are doing the savings also, conditional savings, and banks are coming forward to extend the loan facilities. So everything, or whatever incentives, suppose if somebody does what our secretary said very clearly, 
somebody comes with a concrete proposal, but your incentives you need can be discussed because we are every almost all once in a month, Honorable Chief Minister will conduct a meeting on state investment promotion board. So there we are taking decisions and immediately we are conveying this cabinet and we are taking decisions and we are uh, immediately uh, following all the issues. So I request, so if you have any doubts in uh, this thing, we are clarifying and we are intervening at every level and we are taking all necessary steps. Only thing is, our intention is, as our, uh, we are not resisting, rather than the uh, income to the government, we are looking at a different type. What is? Renewable prices for the farmers. They should get more than the minimum supporting price. And employment generation for the educated people. So these two things. So any such kind of these things, we have doubts or these things, we clarify. And uh, we will help us in this case because why we are number one in ease of doing business assistance, we have policies. Framework policies because otherwise, even to set up an industry, we have to take uh, building permissions from one, uh, these things, corporations, homes, parties, right now. So now everything is single window system. So we are facing that. So if somebody is having any this lands available, we are all identifying the lands, APIs is giving the lands, APIs is providing all infrastructural facilities to the zone. So everything is available. Only thing is, one should come with a concrete proposal. So with uh, what kind of industry, what type of industry you want. So anyway, so we are ready. No, just uh, you talked about Hyderabad. Say Hyderabad is 450 years old city. Now, so we cannot compare 450 and Hyderabad because the combined state of Andhra Pradesh which is interesting. Now, Andhra Pradesh, you look at the whole, you know, starting from southern part of Andhra Pradesh to the north part of Andhra Pradesh. You look at the kind of infrastructure and the advantage which we have. On the southern Andhra Pradesh, you know, Bharti, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, they are approximately to the Bangalore, Chennai, Mumbai, and Hyderabad. This side, Vishaka Pachkam, and then beyond that, Bhutaneshwar, Kolkata, and that complete northeast. You see, look at the train line network. You are coming from North India, going down south beyond Andhra Pradesh, has to go through Vijayapada. There is no other option. By rail, or by road. Look at 978 kilometers of coastline. Already five ports are working and another you know, three or four ports are under construction, maybe another couple of years. So you see the port made development. See the operating airport, six operational airports in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Three of them are international airports. Yes, the cargo and the infrastructure of this country has gone up Airport, you must have read the GMRs or the structure to work. So it's a matter of time. And one thing I can tell you, I was not born and brought up in Andhra Pradesh, but I have been in Andhra Pradesh for the last 34 years. See, the kind of vibrancy and you see, you can't any raw material. I think uh, Prakash was talking about, see, we have got 12 mega food parts where already businesses are happening. Uh, our friend from ITC, the Spices Farm, just next to Guntur, where some of the units have already started production, still some of the units are under construction. We have got 12 universities where four years you know, the food science and technology courses <coughs> are being imparted. We have got a good network of food testing laboratories in a real accredited labs. So we have got skilled manpower, we have got all kinds of infrastructure. Overall, here was talking about uh, almost 50,000 acres of land bank which is available. Now, with regard to the cost, uh, see, the location of industry also depends. <coughs> you go to the Krishna and Godavari Delta, and actually the cost of land is going to be high. Land is scarce there. You go to the Rayal Seva, the cost is going to be much low. But then what government uh, has decided is, see, if depending on the nature of industry, the investment, uh, the employment being created, opportunities in the state, we can go for a customized incentive based on mutual discussion. So if you feel that your industry deserves you know, some consideration for special incentives, you come up with those proposals. The government wants to positively discuss across the board and then decide on those incentives which can be given. So it's a flexible kind of 
Besides fixed kind of incentives which is available in general, we also have the flexible model where it is customized incentive, but that depends on the nature of industry, the product, the employment being generated, the, the quantum of investment and all those things. No. So, see, Andhra is open to any kind of, and Honorable Minister was referring, see, last uh, state industrial promotion board meeting which is chaired by the Honorable Chief Minister. When this issue of land came, it was the Honorable Chief Minister who said that you re-examine the policy. Because many of the investors, uh, they have a problem of financial closure and some other things. Re-examine the policy and come back within a week and let us end. Why we have switched over to the earlier policy that also many of you may be aware. Because the land which was given to them was not being utilized for that purpose. So where, therefore the government's intention is when the land is given that kind of, you know, that kind of industry or employment should come to generate be generated. So now that has also been revised. So we are always looking for suggestions. So whatever suggestions you have, the government is willing to positively examine those suggestions. Ultimately, the government of Andhra Pradesh wants to create a good positive policy environment, uh, ecosystem in the state through which more and more industries could come, state could benefit, people can benefit, in turn, you also get benefited. So that is the sum and substance you know, of our position. Yes, anyone else would like to? <coughs> yeah. Uh, good evening, Mr. Good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Rajesh Ramchandra from Mongolia, India. We have been working very closely with Andhra government and horticulture department for the last few years. And we have been very fortunate to get some of the incentives of the government, especially in the cocoa promotion farming in the state farm. One single suggestion from our side is uh, there is a small gap between the industry standards and what standards the farmers are able to produce in terms of the quality. I think that is applicable to all of the industries also. So in fact, when Jenny uh, was the secretary for the horticulture, Com the horticulture commissioner, we had certain programs for the quality improvement for, during the farmer training programs. If you can extend that farmer training programs from a quality perspective, I think it will help all the agro industries in a long term. So it will, uh, it will also reduce the waste rate that we are talking about earlier. That can be reduced to a very high. It is a suggestion. No, no. It's a valid suggestion. And uh, we are working on it. Uh, uh, see, yes, yes, we will definitely implement on it. Only the government of Andhra Pradesh has started with the support of the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, the GAP certification. So we are conscious of it. And we have also realized, you know, as well, you know, Rajesh was talking about, uh, see, unless we ensure quality, we will not get the value which we deserve or which we expect. So that is something which government is conscious, and we are working on it, and we look forward to your suggestion, and maybe in the partnership we can make a better difference, more you know, impact. Yes. No, so you are looking for the incentives from the government to yes. develop the machinery. Uh, no, no, we will be developing the innovative Or machinery. to utilize the machinery developed by Yes. Yeah. No, see, as I said, Alpudas is a progressive state, ultimately depends on the acceptability by the user. So the machinery developed by any startup company is required by the people, we are willing to take it on a pilot basis. Look at the acceptability and utility of that machine to the people, the basic users. And if that utility is there, definitely why not? There are various schemes where part of the amount is given a subsidy. Okay. Yes. Through that, it can be encouraged. Yeah. So what after the if it is being validated and it is also already passed the pilot? See, it is not a, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So if the acceptability by the potential users is high, government can take it as part of their own scheme, number one. Number two, if that 
machine or equipment has such high utility value, I'm sure large number of people with their own investment would like to adopt it. The third thing which is very critical when we are talking about in the beginning also I had mentioned is, see India is a country where we require customized cost effective solution. Because farmers do not have such deep pocket to invest huge money on the technology. Reason is because of small and fragmented land holding, small level of operation and like maybe after two, three decades when more number of people shift to the service and the manufacturing sector, number of people in the farming sector, but that takes long time because still we have a large number of people. We can do that still. So if that machinery, whatever machinery you design, particularly for the Indian perspective, it should also be cost effective. So if that is that the state government can adopt it as part of the government program, it can be subsidized and partly it can be funded by the farmer or by the bank. So that kind of model is there and we can take it forward. This is Ram Subharati from uh, Nibbles Food Products College in India. We are into millets uh, manufacturing and manufacturing. <coughs> Recently, we are experience, uh, experiencing the millet prices are uh, you know, going up uh, tremendously, and uh, the production cultivation you know, uh, is not uh, matching with the demand. Uh, with that, you know, uh, we are also working with the farmers. Uh, but uh, we could not do much, you know, we were working around uh, 300, 200 to 300 acres uh, closely with the farmers and uh, on the guaranteed price, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, the, on that basis we are procuring. But uh, this year, if you see the cost in you know, a uh, couple of months back, it was 30 rupees. Today is 60 rupees. So we will process it again, it will go to 80, 90 rupees and the customer will distance from, you know, uh, 